It's been quite a week. It was, a, it was only 92 when I got to Portland, 97 the next day, 107 the morning I left. So we may not get a whole lot of sun here on the coast. <laughs> so this is a, a UU General Assembly badge. And as you go around, you get different ribbons. And one of these is our welcoming congregation. We are comfortable with many, many forms of folks. Uh, the second one is the region, which we are part, the Pacific Western region, big faith, no borders. <laughs> the next one down was the UUA bookstore, where I found a number of goodies for us. <laughs> uh, this is our little badge. And then this is a little badge that says, uh, say, see you there, the UU Women's Conference, and it will be uh, in February. So they're inviting us to come to the women's, UU Women's Group. This is the program. <laughs> it was a full event. I'll let Walton uh, April continue the conversation with that, but I have to say, being in a building with several thousand UUs, for 10, 12 hours a day, several days in a row, is something else. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when the Supreme Court has the audacity to pass two very important UU causes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure Walt will report with greater detail during, uh, well, when President Obama began to sing, 150 UUs were standing in the hallway singing with him at the memorial service. So on this day, 239 years ago, the, um, Congress, the Congress of the Colonies, if you will, received the first draft of the Declaration of Independence from the Committee of Five. And Thomas had worked on it at great length, and if you would enjoy a fun version of the story, do get a hold of the uh, video of the musical 1776. Very nicely done, really captures in a rather modern, tongue-in-cheek way uh, the feelings of the time and the experiences they were having and the frustrations they were having, especially that Thomas was having as he was drafting this document. Um, and, and something happened over those next six days as they struggled with this, because Jefferson's first version included the abolition of slavery. And over the next several days, it was deleted. And a few other things were deleted, and uh, a couple of words were added, and, and so on. And you can go online and you can actually see the version that he called his first rough draft. And I'm so glad that did not get accepted. <laughs> it's very difficult reading and, and was very you know, entangled. So all the more reason for watching 1776, you'll understand the shift that happened. His wife showed up. <laughs> So I'm beginning to wonder who wrote it. <laughs> Nonetheless, it was an incredible, incredible time. The guys were just miserable. It was hot. It was human, humid. And you know, they didn't wear light knit cottons, <laughs> loose. Right? And keep in mind that in the 1700s, even Philadelphia had many dirt roads and very few you know, cobblestone streets. And there was a lot of dust in the air and you know, manure and all that kind of stuff floating around. So nobody was very happy. And they're working very hard to do something that they could get killed for. And many of them did get killed for. And many of them lost everything that they owned through the course of signing and following through on this thing we call the Declaration of Independence. Thank heavens that they were willing to. Thank heavens that they did do what they did. And not just for us and for all the generations that have preceded us in this incredible continent, 
but they did something that was the beginning of something for the whole world. Nobody had ever done what they did. The closest thing we have to what happened with the Declaration of Independence prior to that was actually 550 years prior to that when the barons under John, King John, bad King John, you remember Robin Hood, right? Um, <laughs> said, no, you cannot overstep our rights. We are the landholders, we have rights. We manage the knights, we have rights. You can't do this, you can't take our rights. And so the Magna Carta said, the king does not have total authority over all beings. It was the first time in empire culture that had happened since 4000 BC that any group had done that. And they established through that version of the Magna Carta, and it turns out there's like seven or eight versions, and it was finally codified, codified if you will, um, in um, just prior to Henry VII. And you know, that Edward decided, you know, made it clear, and then the Edward after Elizabeth made, you know, wrote in 1689, I think it was, said this is the law of the land. And it became what we call British common law. And that understanding that individual human beings have a birthright that is separate from that of royalty, that is not under the control of royalty, and that their birthright has to do with being able to be treated justly under the law, was the beginning of that way of thinking. But it didn't happen nationally, it didn't happen for a whole group of people saying everybody has this and everybody has the right to say no or everybody has the right to have control over their own lives until the Declaration of Independence, but whoops, we didn't abolish slavery. So we had to go another almost 100 years with the Emancipation Proclamation and then with the 14th Amendment following the Civil War, the war between the states. And that's why the symbolic action of the woman who climbed the pole and took down the Confederate flag is so important. Because it was the 14th Amendment following the war, following the surrender. And someone, has anyone checked the meaning of surrender lately? Someone brought this to a group I was in the other day. It means to align oneself with the winning side. Not exactly what we were raised to think, huh? <laughs> so, the winning side was the side that said all humanity is equal. All humanity have access to equal rights. And so I have this in front of me, so I will have the actual words. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the states in which they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law that shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. And that is the basis on which what we have called the Marriage Rights Act stands. That is the basis on which five members of the Supreme Court said, we cannot and the states cannot limit the rights of any person who is a citizen of the United States. Now there are conservatives in the Supreme Court who think this is not a constitutional issue. We're going to see some interesting outfall from this, and we're going to see some interesting stuff in the country around the marriage, but we're going to see other things. 
because this is a very interesting statement. We hold these rights, says the Declaration of Independence, to be inalienable. Inalienable rights, inalienable rights. Okay? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What is life? What is liberty? What is the pursuit of happiness? We don't have the right to happiness, but we have the right to pursue it. <laughs> and who decides what is a safe way to pursue happiness? And where does tradition end and life begin? There's a number of websites up there that have attempted to understand this, and one of them, the advocate says, in its ruling, the court determined that the U.S. Constitution does indeed require states to allow same-sex marriage effectively, you know, effectively striking down existing bans. Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote the majority opinion. He said, the nature of injustice is that we may not always see it in our own times. The generations that wrote and ratified the Bill of Rights and the 14th Amendment did not presume to know the extent of freedom in all its dimensions. And so they entrusted to future generations a character protecting the right of all persons to enjoy liberty as we learn its meaning. As we learn its meaning. This place, the 13 colonies that became the United States of America, was an experiment, is a continuing experiment. It's a developing process that has been a light to people all over the world. The Declaration of Independence led to revolutions all over Europe. Over a 75-year period, we went from feudal kingdoms to democratic republics all over Europe. That's huge. Right? 75 years is the normal time it takes for a social norm to become norm, <laughs> social idea to become a norm. And it happened throughout Europe. 1848 was the last of those revolutions. And then it began the process of happening around the world. There are very, very, very few feudal kingdoms left in this world. And most of them we call warlords or dictatorships. And in that the reason we call them that is because it is assumed that everyone has the right to make the decisions about the governance. Everyone in the world, all beings everywhere. A huge shift in assumptions. Huge. I, I, you know, we can't even grasp it. We grew up in it. We're like fish swimming in the ocean wondering what the nature of the ocean is. <laughs> And so people come into this country from places where they have not felt they had those rights, and they're at once overjoyed and frightened. How, how do I make these decisions? How can I know enough to make these decisions? And then they find you know, all too quickly that our systems are not very well supporting our ideals. And that is hard. And that's why Unitarian Universalists tend to be very active politically. <laughs> because this is one of those places in a Unitarian Universalist fellowship where these ideals are held close to our hearts. They aren't held out there as something that maybe somewhere someone can have or that we're an historic idea sometime or meaningless empty words, which is what most people are saying when they say things like the Pledge of Allegiance. Or they say the words, the 14th Amendment, and they have no idea what it says. Or whatever, the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment. 
and the Unitarian Universalists hold these close to our hearts, and we do something else. There was a, there's a wonderful t-shirt that floats around Unitarian communities, and I think some of you may own it. It has the UU emblem on the front, and on the back it says, Minds that think, and hearts that love. Unitarian Universalists. This is a place where we get to integrate heart and mind. A place where we recognize that spiritual development is not just following what someone told us spirituality and religion had to be, but where we think it through. Most of us are recovering something else's. We're dealing with the imprints on our childhood of some form of doctrine that limited us in some ways, and we're still kind of dealing with that. And we're dealing with it both intellectually and emotionally. And through that dynamic, we mature spiritually. And this is kind of what Kennedy is trying to help us understand. I appreciate that his name is Kennedy, don't you? <laughs> right. From the ruling, as he wrote it, he pointed out that there are a number of precedents on the subject of marriage that the various court decisions have uh, made. And someone pointed out at the General Assembly, one of these intelligent, intellectual, thinking UUs, that on the 26th of June was the anniversary also of two other court decisions related to this. Kennedy dis addresses both of these. He says, the court decision known as Loving, which I love also, it's the name of one of the uh, people in the case. Loving did not ask about a right to interracial marriage. That was that decision. Turner, that's another great case name, did not ask about a right of inmates to marry. It was the court decision that allowed people in the prison to have marriage, uh, access to marriage licenses. <coughs> and Zablocki did not ask about a right of fathers with unpaid child support duties to marry. Okay. So in each of these court decisions, the decision was not about the specific form of marriage. It was saying, yes, prison inmates, yes, everyone has this right, therefore it applies to prison inmates. Yes, everyone has this right, therefore it applies to interracial couples. And then he says, that principle applies here. Recognizing that new insights and societal understandings can reveal unjustified inequality within fundamental institutions that once passed unnoticed and unchallenged, this court has invoked equal protection principles to invalidate laws imposing sex-based inequality on marriage. And then he goes down a long list of half a dozen. The court acknowledged the interlocking nature of these constitutional safeguards in the context of the legal treatment of gays and lesbians. And then he lists some more cases. This dynamic also applies to same-sex marriage. The challenged laws burden the liberty of same-sex couples. The laws that are being challenged up to that point in the decision burden the liberty. And they abridge central precepts of equality. The marriage laws at issues are, in essence, unequal. And then it goes on from there. Can we learn freedom? Can we learn to give not only ourselves freedoms, but everyone around us the freedom that we long for? That's really what's at heart here. Is this experiment we call America that was first willing to declare that liberty is a fundamental right of all human beings. Can we continue to learn what that means? 
and allow our institutions and our traditions to evolve. Apparently, we can. And for this, I am very grateful. And one of the reasons we can is because there is this institution called Unitarian Universalism. And one of the reasons that we can is because there are people like you who have stood up in all kinds of places and said, is that true? Is that how it has to be? There's a funny story that I often use when I'm teaching change, cl classes based on change and transformation. It has to do with a ham. And some of you may be familiar with this story. This young couple is you know, about to have their first feast. And the young woman you know, pulls out the ham that they've purchased and she begins to hack away at the bone. She's got to cut off the end of that ham. And the husband's looking at her. Why do you do this? I mean, I don't see, there's nothing wrong with that part of the ham. Oh, well, mom always did this. Oh, really? Do you know why she did this? Well, I just assumed it was just, you had to do that in order to cook a ham because mom always did this. So they go to mom. Mom shows up for the feast, and you know, there's this wonderful ham, and the end is cut off, and 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 you know. So they ask mom, and mom says, "Well, my mother always did it." <laughs> well, fortunately, her mother was still on the planet, and so at the next opportunity, they asked her mom, and grandma says, "Well, honey, the pan was too small." <laughs> Sometimes traditions need to be questioned. <laughs> we are so blessed, aren't we? This is a space where we can question. This is a space where we can love each other through the questions. This is a place where we can grow and become who we truly are. Where we can deepen our understanding and expand the meaning of every important concept. And liberty exists because we are here and we hold it dear. And we may we always do so. Happy Fourth of July. Happy Independence Day. Happy Birthday, United States of America.